so let me give a really quick introduction about myself. Um, so I am an educator. I work with kids, but I also do these sort of lectures related to ancient history and mythology. Um, I've done a bunch of uh, courses about mythology and history for um, the Brooklyn Brainery, which, uh, um, and I've also done a bunch of work with historical food, uh, which if anyone is interested in that, I have a food, ancient food blog called Past the Flamingo, which is written at the bottom of the slide. Um, this presentation is not, not focused on food, but food does make a prominent appearance in it, actually, as we'll see. Um, so I wanted to do this because I haven't read this book in a while, and I used to, I, I, I kind of read it beginning when I was really young, and I just have always been very fascinated by it. And so what I'm going to do in this lecture is try to talk about first, a little bit of the context of where it comes from, and also what actually goes on in it, as I'll, I, I'm going to very briefly summarize. But then I also, what I really want to talk about is the symbolism that's present in it, because I think the themes and the symbolism are really fascinating. And that's what is the coolest thing to me about the, the Popol Vuh. Um, so the, uh, the image that you're looking at right now, by the way, this first slide, uh, this is a painting, a watercolor painting by the famous Mexican artist Diego Rivera, who did a whole series of paintings uh, based on this story. Um, so, what is the Popol Wolf? Um, the meaning of the name is the Book of the People or Book of the Community. Uh, it was, so it's from what is today Guatemala, uh, and it originally is written in a language called Quiche, which is a Maya language, because there are, there's not only just one Maya people, there's actually always been like multiple different groups of Maya that also speak different Maya languages that are related to each other. Um, so when they say the book of the people, they really mean the Quiche. This is very much a Quiche story. And it is really historically significant because it is the most complete Maya text that still survives from the historical era, um, which is really, really cool. A lot of the elements of this story, a lot of the religion and the um, mythological aspects of it are traced back to ancient times, although the text itself is not ancient. And I'm gonna go over a quick timeline. Um, but uh, it's a, it, the people that who created this book thought of it as history. It's like a mixture of history and mythology because what's really fascinating about it is that there's multiple sections, and in the first few sections, it tells you the creation of the world, the adventures of the gods and the heroes, the creation of humanity, and then the last section is the history of the Quiche kings. And that part of it is actually documented and can be traced with other, other historical sources. So it's a, it's a mixture of recent history and beliefs that go back very ancient. Um, it's also sometimes considered the National Book of Guatemala, which is pretty cool. Um, the edition of it that I have, which I we just learned that Emily has the same one, uh, is this. There's also, you can find a, a really good edition that has some great uh, commentary by a guy named Michael Christensen, which is online. You can find a, a PDF of it uh, as a translation. So, when you talk about Mesoamerica in general, um, as I say, there's like a lot, there's a lot of different cultures in Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica is a really amazingly diverse um, place, but there's what is referred to as the Mesoamerican culture area, uh, because there's a lot of similarities. All these different people were interacting with each other going back to ancient times. And I think it's important to understand a book like the Popol Vuh in its his original context. Like you kind of, because the people that wrote it thought of it as history, you have to kind of, understand the historical moment that it was coming out of um, to really get at the deeper meaning of the text. So the most influential culture in the broader Mesoamerican region um, would be the uh, people that speak a language called Nahuatl, which is Nahuans, we would call them, like Nahuan culture, which includes what we now know as the Aztecs. Those people are centered in northern Mexico. The Maya are centered in uh, southern Mexico and Guatemala and Belize. So the other end of the region is where the Maya homeland is. But they still have a lot of influence from their neighbors, uh, including in their religion and their belief system. These are a few of the common features of uh, Mesoamerican culture, of this Mesoamerican culture area. that you s And all of these things are prominently featured and referenced in the Popol Vuh itself. Um, what, just briefly, one of them is about the idea of calendar and the idea of the sacredness of numbers. For Mesoamericans, every day is uh, an auspicious time to do something.
something and a bad time to do something else. Um, and every day is ruled over by one or more gods. Gods are worshiped differently and have different aspects depending on the time of year and the time of day. Everything is always very connected to numbers and time and the calendar. Um, you'll notice in the story, there's actually a lot of characters that have numbers in their names. A lot of Maya names are people would might even be named after the day on which they were born. So you'll see a lot of numbers emerging, especially the numbers one and seven. Like there are characters in this story named Seven Death and One Hunter and all things like that. Corn is the staple crop of Mesoamerica. So corn is always connected with human life and corn makes a very prominent and important appearance in the Popol Vuh. Um, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a source of life. The Mesoamericans believed that human beings were made from corn that are, are, and that we basically return to the corn when we die. Um, nature in general is very sacred. There's a lot of animals and a lot of cool references to nature in this story. Um, often animals play the role of helpers of the gods and heroes in the Popol Vuh. Um, Mesoamericans have certain, these next few are all very connected to each other. They have very unique beliefs about the, this energy that imbues living things. They believe that the human body has different seats of different types of energy. And, and all this energy is uh, basically goes through a cycle, through a process of renewal and rebirth. Um, and that's the journey of the underworld. The Popol Vuh is all about heroes journeying to the underworld. And all that stuff is represented in the ball game, which is really kind of the heart of the story because when you boil it down to its very bare bones, it's a story about playing sports. It's a story about these heroes that are challenged to go play a rubber ball sport uh, against a bunch of evil demons. And that's like, that's really what the, the core of it is, but there's so much sort of rich symbolism behind that narrative. So uh, here's a very rough, quick timeline of the, the, how the Popol Vuh came to be as it is today. Um, so uh, the, the image that you're looking at it, by the way, is the ancient Maya ruins of Chichen Itza. Um, I think it's very important to point out when you talk about the Maya or other Mesoamerican peoples that we have a tendency to think of them as ancient and think of them as like old news, basically, that like they don't exist anymore. They were this like lost, forgotten civilization, which is really not true because they cert like they're certainly connected to these ancient traditions, but the Maya, you know, the Maya never went anywhere. The Maya still practice their traditions and they still speak their languages and venerate these stories like the Popol Vuh. Um, so there were always different Maya states, as I, as I mentioned, and they had their own liter written literature. They had a very complex written literature. The Quiche Maya Kingdom, which that little map shows you where that is, um, that's established around the, somewhere around the year 1225 AD in the central highlands of Guatemala. And uh, they developed the Popol Vuh. And the book itself tells us that it was originally sort of guarded by hereditary record keepers, that whose job it was to preserve the story and tell the story. Um, in the introduction of the book, the very, before it really properly begins, the, the preamble says, this is the beginning of the old traditions of this place called Quiche. Here we shall write and we shall begin the old stories, the beginning and origin of all that was done in the town of the Quiche by the tribes of the Quiche nation. And they also go on to say, which I find very interesting, um, later they say, this we shall write now under the law of God in Christianity. We shall bring it to light because now the Popol Vuh, as it is called, cannot be seen anymore. The original book written long ago existed, but its sight is hidden to the searcher and to the thinker. So there was at one time a Maya original of this book and it's gone because the Spanish, when they conquered Guatemala and conquered the Quiche in the, in the year 1524, they destroyed most of the indigenous Maya literature. They, they burned almost all of it. And some enterprising Maya, we don't actually know who it was, but around the year 1550, uh, so during the Spanish conquest, somebody copied it down into the Roman alphabet that was brought by the Spanish. And then they hid it basically. It was preserved in this like library of this one city and nobody knew about it except the Quiche themselves for another 150 years. And then around the year 1702, it was discovered by a Spanish uh, friar who spoke the Quiche language and he translated it. And that was the first time this story was ever known outside of the Quiche lands. But 
what's really cool about it is that it tells you the beginning of the world and like all this primordial history. It ends with the conquest of the Spanish, like the, the Popol Vuh in the very end of it, it actually tells you that. So it's really modern history that they're recording up until that point. And at present, by the way, there's about, uh, there's, you know, a few million Maya people in Central America and Quiche is actually the most widely spoken Maya language today. Um, there's about 2.3 million people that still speak this language, most of them in Guatemala. So uh, this is the breakdown of what is actually in the book. How can you describe the content? Um, as I've said, it begins with the creation of the world, but then it tells of what ultimately boils down to the establishment of world order. Before humanity, modern humanity can be created, we have to put everything in its proper place. Animals have to be given their final modern form and all the, all the rules and regulations have to be established before the earth is ready for human beings. So this part details the conception and birth and adventures of Hunahpu and Shpalanke, who are the hero twins. These are the great heroes of, of, the, of the Popol Vuh itself. Um, the hero twins, they're, they have a bunch of adventures, they do all kinds of crazy things, they have amazing magical powers, and they journey into the underworld, and ultimately they come back. And all of that is necessary to establish the world order, because the very last thing that happens to the hero twins is they become the sun and the moon. So once they become the sun and the moon, after they've fulfilled their destiny and defeated monsters and laid everything into its proper place, now at last humanity can come to being. And at this point, right after the creation of humanity, they skip right ahead to the founding of the Quiche Kingdom, which as I said, was only in 1225. So it wasn't actually very ancient. But uh, the fourth part of it, of the book, the last part, which tells you the history of the Quiche Kings is probably the part that people give the least attention to because it's the least mythological and the least like has all these themes and everything. But even that is also kind of rooted in the mythology. Like it tells you, about real kings and the things that they did. But the first few kings that it talks about, the Popol Vuh says that they were sorcerers and they could change shape and they had all these magical powers. So there, there's really no clear line between the, 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 you know, the, the religion and mythology and the history. It's all um, wrapped up together. Uh, something that I really love to do when I, when I do these kind of talks, because I think it's a really great way of getting immersed in it is, um, I think it's fun to hear quotations in the original language. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm not going to read it because I find Kiche very difficult to pronounce. So instead, I'm going to play the very beginning of someone reading the opening of the Popol Vuh. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's not translated, but just to explain roughly what she's talking about, and you'll see the pictures as well. Um, so in the very beginning, the world according to the story is created uh, when there's a primordial ocean and the two creator gods come into being from a ball of feathers that floats upon the surface of the water. And their names are Tepeo and Kukumats. Um, so I'm gonna play just the very beginning. Also in the beginning of this clip, you'll see, um, which I think is really cute, they did like the numbers counting down to the video started, but it's in Maya numerals, which look very much like Roman numerals. It's like a series of lines and dots. Um, let me see. Popol Wu Nape Nape Manko Tah Kolik Nakota Winak Chiko Tikin Shukuhe Uleu Shakshu Eko Ritakol Itol Tepe Kukumat Alom Shukuhe Aholom Kakitununer Kip Epistar Patak Rash Shik Rech Rikuk Chil Shar Shik Rech Ri Rashon So what happens in the very beginning is the two gods are born from this magical ball of feathers. Um, Tepeo is associated with the sun, 
the other one, uh, Kukumats, is the feathered serpent. And this is a very common Mesoamerican uh, figure in mythology. This is, he's probably better known actually by an, uh, the name that the Aztecs call him, which is Quetzalcoatl or Quetzalcoatl. Um, and so this, the feathered serpent god, uh, is found throughout Mesoamerica by various different names and is often associated with the creation of humanity and the creation of the world. Um, the, when they say feathered, they're specifically talking about this bird, which is on the slide. Um, the, the, the K'iche name for this bird is, is Kuk, which is the, in, in the god's name. Um, but we know it by the Aztec name as the Quetzal, the resplendent Quetzal, which is a really, really sacred bird in Mesoamerica. Um, it's actually still today a very important symbol of Guatemalan heritage. It's on their flag, it's the national bird, and it's also the name of Guatemala's currency. That's how important this bird is to the heritage of the Maya. Um, but anyway, so they create the world, the two gods. They decide to bring everything into being, and there's some other uh, gods that appear, and it's not really made clear whether they make them themselves or they just kind of come into being on their own. Uh, and then they they realize that the animals that they've created, uh, the animals are not able to properly praise the gods. The animals can't speak, so they can't say anything to thank the gods for their creation. So they just realize the necessity of creating human beings. Um, and they actually try twice and fail. The first two failed attempts before the order of the world is established. And this is key, I think, that it's, they, they can't succeed because the world order has not been set yet. So they try to make people out of clay, but the people made of clay are not intelligent, so they can't praise the gods either. So then they make people out of wood, but the people made of wood are intelligent, but they have no heart and they have no feeling and they're cruel and they don't want to praise the gods either. So actually, they just, eventually they destroy the people of wood uh, with, as in many mythologies around the world, with a flood. Uh, they wash them away with a great flood. And the last few remaining wood people that manage to climb into the trees in order to escape from the flood, they become monkeys. And that's where monkeys come from. There's a lot of little details like that in the Popol Vuh that are like, and that's why this animal looks the way it does, or that's where this particular animal comes from. They love those little tiny creation detail type of stories um, because everything is being put into place. Everything's being set up. Uh, and the, the lack of order in this stage of the world is represented most clearly by the fact that a group of monsters seize power over the world, still in the time of the wood people, and they demand to be worshipped. One of them, uh, the leader, uh, is uh, a creature named Bukukakish, which means seven macaw. He's a parrot demon. Uh, he's my favorite character, by the way. And um, seven macaw has beautiful gemstones in his his face and he has gemstone teeth and so he tells everyone that they should worship him because of his shining glowing stones and they, he says uh, worship me as the sun and the moon and they refer to him in the book as the false sun which if you recall the hero twins what happens to them at the end they become the real sun and the moon so ultimately it's the destiny of the hero twins to defeat this monster and defeat his his family and thus bring order to the world um, did we, oh, here we go. Um, so here's a little family tree of the hero twins themselves who are at the, hero twins themselves are at the bottom left. Um, and an interesting thing you'll notice about this family tree is that there's multiple sets of twins. There's actually a repetition of male twins in this story. Um, and it's, it's a nod to that, that very classic Mesoamerican belief that everything is, repeats itself. Everything is a cycle. Our ancestors die and the grandchildren come back in the form of their grandparents and like all that, like everything just is reborn. So um, there's a sense that the hero twins from the moment of their birth, their destiny is to do what their fathers failed to do. Um, and the story of the hero twins really begins with the death of their father and their uncle. It's also interesting at certain points, they describe the two elder twins, the previous year twins. Sometimes they call them our fathers as though both of them are the father. And sometimes it, it's more clear like, oh, one is our father and one is just our uncle. But it's like they're, because these, where these guys failed, they have to pick up and they, their destiny is to follow. Um, and where exactly did they fail has, goes back to uh, the center of the story being, um, the Mesoamerican ball game. 
the conception of the hero twins and the origin of the hero twins is one part of the story that I, I want to focus on a little bit because I think it's one of the most fascinating parts of the whole story. Um, so the, the first pair of twins, the earlier pair of hero twins, uh, their names are Hun Hunachpu and Vukup Hunachpu, which means one hunter and seven hunter. And uh, they are playing the ball game and they are doing it so loudly that it distracts and upsets the lords of Shibalba, which is the land of the dead. Um, and so the lords down in Shibalba, who are all monstrous and they have all kinds of horrible names like Scab Ripper and Blood Drinker, and there's also a one death and a seven death. They're just all a bunch of monsters and they're served by creepy demons and also by creatures of the night like bats and owls. Um, so the lords of Shibalba ask these twins to come down to the underworld and, cha and they challenge them to a ball game. They say, come play against us. Uh, they do and they have to pass through many challenges and trials and tests just to even get to the ball game. They have to cross a river and, and just all these crazy things. And finally, when they get there, they play the game and they lose. And so the lords of Shibalba kill them. And after they kill them, uh, Hun Hunachpu is decapitated and his head is buried beside the ball court and it sprouts into a special type of tree called the Calabash tree. Um, calabash, you may have heard of, is a gourd. Uh, calabash tree is a different plant, but the, they're both, they, have, they're, they share the same name because the fruit of both of them can be used the same way. The fruit can be used to dry it out and made into like a watertight container. Many cultures around the world use calabash gourds for this purpose, including the Maya. The calabash tree is unique to Central America, but it was also used in the same purpose. And the calabash tree, that's a picture on this slide, is of calabash tree fruit when they fall to the ground. The fruits are round and hollow and about the same size as a human head. And they also, as they age, they turn this gross brownish color that looks like old bone. So the Maya associated this tree very strongly with skulls and human heads. So they believe that this tree grew from the severed head of this, this guy. Um, and at this point, now, nobody wants to go close to the tree that's covered in the creepy skull head fruit, which includes the head of Hun Hun Ahpu is actually hanging in the branches. But there is a young woman in the underworld who decides, she, she is drawn to the fruit and she decides to approach. Um, there are people in Shibalba, but they're not the souls of dead people living down there, like you would imagine, like hell or something. They're just, they're just underworld spirits, like they're all divine creatures, basically. And so she's the daughter of one of the lords of Shibalba. Her name is Shkik, which can be translated as Lady Blood or as Little Blood, but her name is Blood, which is also quite significant, as we'll get into. Um, but basically, she approaches the head on the tree and... Uh, the, the head in the tree uh, talks to her, and it, this, is my, this is one of my favorite parts in the whole book. Um, at first, it, it's, uh, it, it, it warns her not to come closer, and it says, what is it you wish? These round objects which cover the branches of the tree are nothing but skulls. So he tries to warn her, and he says, do you want them? And she says, yes, I want them. So the skull says, very well, stretch out your right hand. And she sticks out her hand and the head spits into her hand and the spit miraculously disappears. And then the head starts talking to her about birth and new generations. And the head says, um, in my spittle, I have given you my descendants. Now my head has nothing on it anymore. It is nothing but a skull without flesh. So are the heads of great princes. The flesh is all that gives them a handsome appearance. And when they die, men are frightened by their bones. So too is the nature of the suns, which are like saliva and spittle. They do not lose the substance when they go. And he's talking about dead people. They don't lose their substance when they go. They bequeath it. The image of the Lord or the wise man or the orator does not disappear, nor is it lost. He leaves it to the daughters and the sons which he begets. So very, very Maya. Everything comes back around. The new generation generation is the birth of the old generation. And so uh, she, she becomes miraculously pregnant from the, the head spinning into her hand. She becomes pregnant with the hero twins. At this point, the lords of the underworld are upset with her because they think that she has been unchaste and has gotten pregnant. And uh, she runs away. She flees to the surface world. And uh, 
the lords of the Shibalba send monsters after her and they say, you know, bring us her heart and her blood. Um, but the monsters take pity on her and instead they bring the lords, uh, that, which you also see on this slide, they bring them um, kopal, which is an incense from like the sap of a plant. And they also bring, her, bring them um, a cacao pod, a cacao seed pod, which is reddish and roughly resembles a human heart. Um, and these two things are burned as offerings for the lords of Shibalba and they are satisfied. Uh, and then she goes and actually, uh, she ends up seeking refuge at the home of Khun uh, Khunachpu's mother, who's the old grandmother of the gods. And that's where the hero twins are raised. And so this is, this is this bizarre sort of circumstances is where they are born. It has parallels not only in other mythologies around the world, the idea of great heroes who are going to have a great destiny, they can't have a regular birth. They have to have a miraculous birth in some way or conception. Um, but even in other Mesoamerican mythology, like one of the Aztecs have a similar, a very similar story about a goddess being magically impregnated through her hand, essentially. Um, the twins themselves, as I said, their names are Hunachpu and Shpalanke. Hunachpu is the same name as their dad. It means hunter. Or more properly, it means blowgunner because their weapon of choice is the blowgun. And they're always shown like in this image, in Maya art, they're always shown like shooting things with a blowgun. Uh, Shpalanke's name is a little unclear exactly what it means, but it's believed to contain the word Ba'alam, which means jaguar. And Shpalanke is often depicted as in this image on the slide, he with um, spots on his skin, which separates him from his brother. And this is, I think very significant because I think they're meant to, you know, they're meant to represent that they are a perfectly matched pair. They're like one soul in two bodies. They're one of them is named Hunter and the other one is named after the great hunter of the animal kingdom, the jaguar. Um, what, there's, a, there's a suggestion that maybe early, early in a version of the story, it was actually a male twin and a female twin, which would give another perfect pair of one male and one female. Um, Every Mesoamerican god in some way is a twin because they always are, they have a different aspect of the day and of the night. They have, as I said, with the calendar, they're worshiped differently at different times of the year. So this theme of duality and multiplicity is really, really common in Mesoamerican religion. Um, like you'll, you'll notice even in the creation story, the, the world is created by two gods. Everything goes back to two. Um, and the hero twins themselves exist in other Native American cultures, even outside of Mesoamerica. The image on the upper right, that, that is copied from a work of art from the Mississippian culture, which, which is from the central and south, uh, southern, um, what is now the United States. They also had hero twins and they depict them in their artwork in a very, very similar way. And it's the same around, as I said, like in Maya art, you see over and over again, these same stories going back really far, even though the Popol Wuh itself is not extraordinarily ancient. Before they get to the underworld, because their ultimate destiny is they got to go back to the underworld and defeat the lords of the dead. That's what they were born for. They have to become ball players and defeat the lords of the dead. But uh, first, uh, before that, they have to destroy the monsters, like I said, that have taken over the earth. So it's like they have to set things right on earth before they can set things right in the underworld. Um, this is Vukup Kakish, the seven macaw. Um, he is inspired by a creature called a scarlet macaw, uh, which is depicted on the upper left. The painting in on the paintings on the on the left and the right are from ancient Maya artwork. It's a very common motif of a bird god or a bird demon or spirit sitting on top of a tree. And often it's as in the bottom left image, it's shown with a um with a, a hero or two heroes, the hero twins, are about to shoot it with a blowgun. And that is exactly what happens in the story. That's how they defeat the monster. Um, the painting in the middle, by the way, I did. So that's my version of Vukub Kakish. <laughs> it's a watercolor. Um, but I gave him this, you know, before they take away all his magical jade stuff. Because what happens is they shoot, I love this, this detail. They shoot him in the jaw with a blowgun. They give him a terrible toothache. And then he goes to bed. And then they come, the, the twins come to him disguised as doctors. And they tell him, well, to cure your toothache, we have to pull all the magic pieces of jade off of your face and you have to pull out the teeth out of your beak. And so he lets them do it and it, he loses his power when they take everything away and then he dies. Um, and then they also had to defeat his two sons who are also great monsters. 
But this is another one of those little creation detail stories though, because as you'll notice from this, the scarlet macaw that's depicted here, um, scarlet macaws have no teeth and they have this big bare patch on their face with little tiny eye. So it looks like something has been removed from their face. And that was the Maya explanation for why this bird looks this way. Um, Vukov Kakish represents very much this like grandiosity and this false pride. And he has to be humbled and removed from power before the twins can really get to their main goal, which is the underworld. Um, Shibalba, the, the land of the dead, means the name means the place of fear. And uh, again, the hero twins have to, uh, they have to face their destiny and they have to follow all these terrible trials in order just to get to the ball game. They, the lords invite them to the ball game and initially, interestingly enough, initially they are actually kept from following their destiny because their grandmother, the twins' grandmother who, who helped raise them, she's afraid for them. She thinks they're gonna die just like her sons did. So um, she gives them, or she takes their, uh, her son's ball player uniforms and hides them. But the twins find them. And when they find them, they have to put them on and they have to go follow their destiny. They tell their mother and their grandmother, we will plant these two corn plants. And while we're in the underworld, if the corn withers or dies, then you know that we also have died. So again, corn being like super centrally connected to human life. Um, they go down to the underworld and they have to cross a river of blood and the lords place all these insane trials in front of them. Like they have to spend a night in a chamber where it's incredibly cold. They have to um, survive a wind of knives that flies around cutting them and stuff like that. And they, but because the twins are very powerful and magical, they manage to pass all of these many tests, often with the help of animal friends. And what I love about the story is that, well, we've already seen Quetzals and Scarlet Macaws, but there's a lot of like very, very cool um, Central American wildlife that's like unique to this region, like leaf cutter ants, the ants that carry little pieces of leaf on their backs. Those are, those make an appearance in this story. Jaguars make many appearances in the story. Um, but so finally, finally, they get to play the ball game. And at this point, uh, their last challenge, like the night before the ball game, is they have to spend a night in a chamber full of bats. And Hunahu, one of the twins, he's beheaded by the by a bat demon, bat monster. So very obviously paralleling the same thing happened to his father in the previous version. Like it just everything is repeating itself. But this time he has his brother with him to help. So his brother um, creates a false head for him using, of course, a gourd. Calabash gourd. Calabash from, not from the tree, but a real calabash uh, from the ground. And, uh, and then they're able to play the game. And so um, at this point, I'm going to show a really a quick, another quick little clip. Uh, there's an animated version of the Popol Vuh. I think this is from, I think it's from the 1980s. It's one hour and it's based on uh, ancient Maya art, which is really, really cool. Like the style of animation is supposed to imitate Maya art. But I'm just going to show you the moment of the ball game itself and um, what what transpires. So hang on. Rabbit had been waiting. He bounded off, and all of Shibova chased him, shouting and running after what they thought was the ball. Jaguar deer exchanged the pumpkin for Hunter's head before Shibova returned. How does that feel? Much better. Thank you, brother. There it is. Found the ball. Come back and play ball. They played again. smashed into the wall and sprayed pumpkin seeds over all the lords. 
that is what we feel of the lords of sickness and the lords of darkness. Hunter and Jaguar deer had endured all the trials of Shibalba. They had neither died nor had they been defeated. Yet still the lords of Shibalba ruled. It was then that the twins saw the sign in their hearts. They would die. Die by fire in Shibalba and their bones would be cast into the river. They called two seers, two sages. Tell the lords to grind our bones on the stone, the way fresh corn is ground, and to sow it into the river. Say that this is your prophecy. So, um... There's this really interesting idea in there, this idea that they've actually almost won. It's that they won the game. It seems like they're gonna win, but they realize that they're trapped in a never ending cycle. They're just repeating the same cycle of fate of what happened to their fathers or father and uncle, the twins going down to face the Lords of Death. And so they sort of come to this realization that the only way to actually um, gain power over this endless cycle is to actually die and be reborn. And so that's what ends up happening to them. They die and they are reborn, and this time they go back one last time and they, they actually do defeat the Lords of Shibalba because after they are reborn, they have the power over life and death. They have power to bring back the dead and do all these crazy things. And, for them, and then at that point, they go and become the sun and the moon because they've finished setting the world into order and now human beings can be created. And of course, what else are human beings created with? What material will they use this time? They, they, they tried clay before, they tried wood. This time they create human beings out of corn. So our modern race of humans is made from corn and also from the God's own blood. Um, so the corn and the sun and the moon and also the life and death of human beings are all seen to follow the same cycle because they go down into the ground and then they are reborn and they come back up again. The, the planting of a seed is the same as putting bones in the ground and the new growth is the same as the sun rising. All these things are connected with each other very closely in Maya and Mesoamerican thought. Um, as I said, the, a lot of the influence on this story comes from other Mesoamericans and ultimately comes from the Aztecs, from the Nahuan culture in the north. The people that founded the Quiche Kingdom themselves originally came from the north. So they brought that culture with them. And so the story is very rich in these themes and symbols that are common across Mesoamerica, although they have a uniquely Quiche twist on them. Um, the ball game symbolizes the cycle of life and the journey of the soul. And that's why the ball game is the center. Uh, I want to, so in the sort of final part of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about these, this, these themes and about why the ball game has this symbolic significance. And it, ulti it ultimately is tied to <clears throat> the Mesoamerican beliefs about energy and about sacrifice. Because the gods created human beings using corn and also using their own blood. So as a result, we have to give our blood as an offering back to the gods. Human sacrifice is a really common theme across Mesoamerican religion. And it is not always fatal. And it's not always massive on a wide scale. Non-fatal forms of human sacrifice, such as bloodletting, were very common as offerings. Like that's what the woman is doing in the image on the right. She's pulling, I, I always think this is like the worst thing ever because it sounds so painful. She's like pulling a cord with spines on it through her tongue in order to release blood so that that can be an offering for the gods. That was how the Maya and other Mesoamericans made this type of non-fatal offering of human energy. Um, and, you know, this is a, the, the Maya also didn't practice human sacrifice on a big scale. They weren't sacrificing tons of captives or prisoners of war, like we might think of the Aztecs doing. It was a smaller and more significant thing. It's interesting to note, though, that in the Popol Vuh, the lords of the dead don't get offered human sacrifice. 
they demand the heart and the blood of the mother of the hero twins, and they get symbolic heart and blood instead. They get fake heart and blood. This is a nod to the fact that uh, there might be earlier traditions that were different. Like, by the time this story was recorded and written down, the Kichi they were not sacrificing people to the Lords of the Dead anymore. They weren't, they, maybe their ancestors did, but they don't do that anymore. So this is an explanation of why the Lords of the Dead don't get human sacrifice. They get symbolic human sacrifice. And also connected with this is um, this idea that there's not just one soul in the human body. There's many different parts. There's different like aspects of energy that come from different parts of the body. Um, this is a modern painting by a Mexican artist who does these really amazing religious, uh, like religious paintings based on traditional Mesoamerican religion. Um, and he uses all the Aztec Nahuatl terminology to describe it. Um, but he, so this is, this painting is supposed to show a soul or a person rather, a person at the moment of death and the different parts of their soul are emerging from different parts of their body. And his explanation of it is so beautiful that I'm just gonna read it of how he, he describes these three different, um, different divisions of the body. So the three, uh, so he says, the body contains within itself uh, numerous animating energies or souls. The three most important of these, and these are the Aztec names, are the Tonali, the Teolia, and the Iyot. These are independent entities who possess agency and will. Together they give life, warmth, and vitality to the body and compose our spiritual self. In the crown of the head dwells the Tonali, which is associated with the heavens and expresses itself physically as growth. It is the vivifying force of heat which warms our bodies and in it is contained thought and will, the knowledge of right and wrong, and it is linked to our destiny. Our teolia resides in our heart and is linked to the earth. That is the site of love, personality, and emotional wisdom, and like the tonali rules thought. It is expressed in the body as blood. The eiyot, uh, which is the one that's less significant to this story, but still very interesting, um, resides in the liver and rises up from the underworld. It is the site of vitality, passion, greed, sexuality, envy, powerful emotions which rise up unbidden and without control. In death, these different souls leave our body, ultimately reuniting and returning to the fabric of the cosmos. Um, so the hero twins are born from a human head spitting into the hand of a woman named Blood. So there's a lot of symbolism going on here. And it has to do with this idea with these like different seats of energy. There's these like very symbolic and very powerful uh, expressions of human life and like force basically. Um, the final, so what the ultimately the belief that Mesoamericans have about the teolia, which is the heart and the blood, and that's the individual soul. Um, they believe that its role after death is to go to the underworld and be prepared for rebirth, be prepared for reincarnation. The Mesoamerican underworld is not a final resting place. It is a, a journey or a process of many steps which culminates in rebirth and reincarnation. The soul, the part of the soul that goes down there um, is stripped of personality, of emotions, of everything until it's sort of pure again and then it returns to the earth in a new form. Um, one of the Aztec names that was given to the land of the dead was Shimalan, which means the place of polishing, because the soul is being polished like a gemstone in order to prepare it for a, a rebirth. And so the way that this is described, saying like human beings, human souls have to go through all these crazy different steps and processes and everything, it sounds remarkably similar to the trials of the hero twins. This idea that uh, a human soul has to go through all these steps in order to prepare for the reincarnation in the next life is very similar to the hero twins have to go through all these steps to prepare for their final reincarnation and for their ball game. Um, one of, in fact, some of them are shared in common, like crossing the river, which is common in underworld stories around the world, and also the wind of knives. Um, the, the, the Mesoamericans believed that the wind of knives um, it, cle it cleaves the flesh away from the bones and then, it, and then the bones are removed. So then all that is left is the pure soul. So though the, these type of things, there's a sense that maybe in an earlier, more ancient version of the story, maybe it was more complicated or maybe it was like, maybe the details were in a different order, but the K'iche took those same details and 
interpret them in their own way. And then of course you end up with the ball game, um, which is the ball game, as I say, the ball game represents the cycle. The ball game is the, the single most important element of the story. In Mesoamerican cities, ball courts were placed usually at the heart of a city. They were very, very important to the livelihood of a city. And the ball game itself um, has multiple, uh, multiple purposes and multiple, uh, rep like it means multiple different things in Mesoamerican culture. On the one hand, it is actually a source of entertainment. Sometimes it was just played as a sport for fun, but also it was often played in rituals. Under certain circumstances, the players would be sacrificed after a game, although it's not exactly clear and the, cir the exact circumstances probably vary from place to place and culture to culture, but it seems like sometimes um, there might be pitched battles where they would have prisoners fighting against seasoned ball players and the prisoners would end up getting sacrificed or maybe sometimes the ball players themselves would. Um, but it's very, very much connected to the battle of life and death. This is the oldest rubber ball sport in the world because the rubber tree itself is from Central America. Um, the exact way that it's played is slightly unclear, uh, although we do know that it involves a hoop. Uh, there's like this stone hoop that's set into the side of the, 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 uh, the ball court and it's believed, based also on descriptions from around the time of the Spanish conquest, that um, ball players of the ball game, part of what they have to do is hit the ball with uh, body parts besides their feet and their hands. So they're like hitting it with their arms and with their sides. Um, the Spanish, when they were describing games of the, of the ball game, they said that they would see professional players would get like these horrible bruises from being hit with this really hard rubber ball. And actually, Modern, in modern times, there is a version of the game that's still played, um, which is what's that, where the photo comes from, uh, which is called Ulama. And uh, modern Ulama players also can get some really nasty bruises. So it's a very physically demanding game. It's a challenging game. And it's, it's very symbolic to, and it's very central to this story. Um, it could be used to settle disputes. It could be used for ritual. It's like, it's, you know, it's a very important Mesoamerican activity. Um, now, it, it is suggested that sometimes the Mesoamericans may have actually used a human head as the ball. Uh, certainly, it's depicted in mythology and in art, like it's in the Popol Vuh, as we, in the clip that I showed you from the animated movie. Um, but uh, in any case, it's very strongly associated with skulls and heads, because usually right adjacent to the ball court, you have the Tsumpantli. The Tsumpantli is a skull rack. It's a wall of skulls or a wall of human heads. It, uh, sometimes these are symbolic, like in the image on the slide. But it used to be believed by archaeologists that they were only symbolic. But now we know that actually sometimes they were real. They were the heads of sacrificial victims that were piled up because heads are the seat of that tonali energy. They're the seat of creation energy energy, which is associated with life and the sun and birth. And so by collecting heads, it's like a stored reserve of this, of this special energy that's being used to kind of sanctify the city. Um, but a head, because like we said, uh, bones going into the earth is equivalent to seeds going into the ground. So a, a severed head, a, a reserve of energy is compared with a fruit full of seeds. So, and you can see it in imagery like a tree of skulls, like the tree of skulls that is, begins the stole thing of the hero twins in the Popol Vuh. Or at the later in the story, as we saw in the animated clip, the head, the fake head of a, that's a gourd, it smashes and it scatters seeds all over the place in the underworld. So this, there's this idea of the head as being a potential source of growth and creation and life. Um, so the, the last thing that I want to um, touch on before we open it up for discussion and questions and all of that, is that I think what's really interesting is that the, the Kiche were aware on some level that this cycle, this endlessly repeated cycle of life and death that is so prominent in their religion and their mythology, they also saw echoes of it in their history and they used their religious understanding of that to, to understand their own history basically. Um, if you go to the end of the book, to the very end of the, of the Popol Vuh, where it tells you about all the kings and it just lists, you know, the generations of the kings of the Quiche. 
At the very end, it says, Oshibkwe and Belachebtsi, the 12th generation of kings, these were those who reigned when Donadiu came and who were hanged by the Spaniards. So it ends with the, the transfer of power, the Spaniards coming in and killing the, the, the native kings and uh, ruling over them after that. Donadiu is the Quiche pronunciation of the Aztec name Tonatiu, which means the sun. But in this case, they are referring not to the literal son, they're referring to a guy named Pedro de Alvarado, who is depicted on this uh, slide. Pedro de Alvarado was a conquistador. He was one of Hernán Cortés's generals. He is responsible for the conquest of Guatemala and apparently for the, kill, the, the death of the last kings of the Quiche. Um, but the Aztecs originally called him the son because he had blonde hair. And later, this name stuck to him and it was used by Mesoamericans throughout the whole region, even if they didn't speak the Aztec language, like as in this case with the Maya. So there's this idea that the sun, because the sun goes through the same process of death and rebirth, the sun is the great bringer of change and the great bringer of transformation. So the way that they understood the conquest of the Spanish was that the, the Spanish basically have sent this champion in the form of the sun. And this is a, a symbol that there's going to be a new era, that the, the old way of doing things is changing, and now there's going to be a new, new order of rule. Um, in Maya Christianity, after Christianity and Catholicism is introduced to Central America, the Maya always associate Jesus Christ with the sun. And it's for the same reason, because the, the story of Jesus, of him being a, a, a figure that dies and is reborn, that submits willingly to being sacrificed, basically, submits willingly to the process of death and rebirth, and thus gains power over life and death. And so the story of Jesus, in, a, in an interesting way, actually fits in very nicely with the Maya cosmology. Um, and so I think it's really, I, I really like how these themes are present in so many different cultures and sometimes overlapping with each other because of uh, not only inter, you know, interactions between cultures like we see within Mesoamerica, but then also actual conquest and colonization and even a religion being forced on a group of people that they're able to kind of overlap and intermingle with each other in this way. Um, so yeah, and I, I think it's also just the last thing I'll, I'll add is that I think it's a, it's a really interesting, um, really interesting way to consider how the, the Popol Vuh itself has also passed into a new era of, and a new, it, it's transformed. The book started out as a Maya text that was written by, by the Maya themselves, and then it became a, uh, written in a new form and then it became translated and it was spread and now people you know study it and read it in a way that uh, was never done before so this um yeah there's this very interesting idea of change and transformation that runs throughout the whole story uh so thank you very much for listening <laughs>